subject and will not uh, fund any more. So I think we have made the position clear. It is obviously up to the Council if, uh, council if they want to look for further extensions. Thank you. That ends uh, general questions. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, last week I announced a, a judge-led inquiry into the Edinburgh Tram project. Today I can confirm the inquiry will be chaired by the former Lord Advocate and Senior Judge Lord Hardy. Uh, the terms of reference for the inquiry have been agreed with Lord Hardy. They will be to inquire into the delivery of the Edinburgh Trams project in order to establish why the project incurred delays, cost considerably more than originally budgeted for, and delivered significantly less than was project projected for reductions in scope. Lord Hardy, I can assure the Chamber, will establish the inquiry immediately, and we look forward to a swift and thorough inquiry. Joanne Lamont. Claire Lally is a woman I am proud to know. She is a loving mother of twins, a former Mother of the Year. Claire's seven-year-old daughter, Katie, has multiple disabilities. Claire's experience caring for Katie has inspired her to fight for better rights for all carers. And we know in this week of all weeks, in Carers' Weeks, that we should reflect on how tough that fight is. The First Minister has acknowledged her as a carer's champion. He has even been to her house. Why did Claire Lally deserve to have the First Minister's most senior adviser undermine her credibility and unleash a torrent of vile abuse on the internet? First Minister. Well, first thing, Claire Lally, uh, Joanne Lamb is quite right. I, I know Claire Lally. I have met her twice. <clears throat> I hold her in the highest regard. Her views, not just in terms of her own family, and let me say I do not regard her as a, a, an ordinary mother, I regard her as extraordinary in terms of the challenges that she has met and faced and overcome. But more importantly, in terms of her contribution to society, <clears throat> I think her views on carers and the challenges faced by carers in general uh, have been substantially informative of the government's approach, both in terms of what has been done and, and also what was outlined in the consultation earlier this year and which will be carried forward into legislation, which I believe and the carers' organisations, I believe, will uh, improve the lot of carers across Scotland who do valuable and important work. In terms of the description of Campbell Gunn, I do not accept that Campbell Gunn was responsible for a, quote, torrent of abuse across the internet. I do not think anybody who believes uh, and knows Campbell Gunn would give that a moment's credence. Uh, I think Campbell Gunn made both a mistake and a misjudgment. Uh, the mistake was obvious, uh, that saying that somebody was Pat Lally's daughter-in-law, when it clearly clear is not, uh, is a mistake. The misjudgment is believing that drawing attention in an email to someone's Labour Party connections, whether it is a member of the Shadow Cabinet or any other connection, eh, was an appropriate thing to do. That was a misjudgment, eh, because Clare's views on caring and other matters stand regardless of her Labour Party connections. Eh, because he made a mistake and a misjudgment, I asked Campbell to apologise, which he did immediately and comprehensively. You know, for those who saw Claire Lally's tears last night on the television, I don't think they will think much of that as an answer. And if we're talking about a response being ill-judged, it couldn't be more ill-judged than what the First Minister has said. Because Claire Lally's crime, as far as the First Minister's most senior adviser was concerned, was to describe herself as an ordinary mother. And that, as the First Minister has reflected, she was being modest. She is an extraordinary mother. Her crime, as far as Campbell Gunn was concerned, was as a mother to say she thought her daughter's future would be better if Scotland stays in the United Kingdom. What she did not deserve was to be undermined by Alex Salmond's most senior adviser and then to be abused on the internet that she had to shut down her Facebook and Twitter accounts. The First Minister's office contacted Claire while she was in York Hill Hospital for her daughter's appointment. They then sent her Campbell Gunn's press release. Instead of sending a copy of a press release, shouldn't the First Minister enforce the Special Advisor's Code and sack his adviser for a personal attack on a member of the public? First Minister. The, uh, the, the reason that uh, Campbell Gunn did not write personally to, to Claire is she asked that that did not happen. Uh, that is why uh, the, uh, the apology, which was comprehensive, uh, was issued in the way it was, because Claire specifically requested that it not be done directly. 
I said that Campbell had committed, in my view, a mistake and a misjudgment. I don't think he was engaged in vile personal attack on Claire Lally, as Joanne Lamont has indicated. The reason I, I, I think that is pointing out to a journalist uh, that Claire is a member of Labour's shadow cabinet, which is correct, and mistakenly that he was the, she was the daughter-in-law of former Labour Lord Provost Pat Lally, uh, is not vile personal attack and can't be construed as such. It was a mistake to do it for obvious reasons. It was a misjudgment for the reasons I've already stated. Uh, but that is not uh, the area, because I take very seriously uh, the Ministerial Code and the Special Advisors Code. I know exactly what's in the code. I know exactly why it's there. And it's not a reasonable thing to suggest that Campbell Gunn, in any way, shape or form, was responsible for internet abuse uh, directed at Claire Lally. Everyone, everyone in this chamber, everyone in Scottish society it should condemn the few mindless idiots who commit such abuse on whoever they perpetrate it. <laughs> and since we in this chamber, just about everyone, has had the privilege of knowing Campbell Gunn over many years, no one in this chamber seriously believes that Campbell Gunn was responsible or orchestrating any such abuse. None of us seriously believe that. So let us accept that Campbell made a mistake and a misjudgment for which he has comprehensively apologised. That is the right way to deal with these things, as opposed to accuse Campbell of something he would never, ever possibly have done. Joanne Lamont. You know, this isn't a simple mistake about getting somebody's family connections wrong. This is about a woman with a proud record of campaigning, a mother of a disabled child being called a liar, a quizzling and a collaborator. It doesn't get much more serious than that, and the information was taken from a website that said that. We know that Claire Lally has fought for better rights for carers throughout this country. She's spoken to every party that will listen in the hope something will be done to improve the lives of children like her daughter Katie. That is why she has been involved in politics. But for Campbell Gunn, that passion, that care, that spirit is for nothing because Claire Lally wants Scotland to stay in the United Kingdom. For Alex Salmond's most senior advisor, her life experience, her struggle didn't matter. For him, Claire Lally could be undermined and abused because she supports the union. Personal attacks by special advisers should lead to automatic dismissal, according to the Special Advisers Code. The First Minister has admitted this was a personal attack. Campbell Gunn has admitted it was a personal attack. The only thing missing is the dismissal. Does the First Minister not realise that if Campbell Gunn is not sacked, we can only conclude that the First Minister has the same level of contempt for people like Claire Lally as his most senior adviser. First Minister. No, I have already made it clear that I hold Claire Lally in the highest regard. I think her contribution, uh, not both in her life story and struggle, but also in terms of the, the opinion she has put forward on how we can make the lot of carers in Scotland better, is a valuable and important contribution. A Campbell Gunn has not admitted that he made a vile personal attack. He has said uh, that he made a misjudgment and a mistake and got his facts wrong. There is nothing in Campbell Gunn's email that fits the description of a vile personal attack. Saying that someone is a member of Labour's shadow cabinet and wrongly saying that they're a daughter-in-law of former Labour Lord Provost of Glasgow, Pat Lally, does not constitute a vile personal attack. No one seriously believes that Campbell Gunn is guilty of orchestrating vile abuse on the internet, and it really it demeans this suggestion and Campbell to, to say that. Can I remind uh, uh, Joanne Lamont that last year uh, Campbell Gunn got a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, in terms of his contribution to journalism in Scotland over 46 years. This is what she said last year. Campbell has proven himself to be a tough but fair journalist, thoughtful and wise, observer of politics and thoroughly good company. Few reporters can claim to be on good terms with all those he writes about, and this is his testament to his professionalism and good nature. Does Joanne Lamont really believe that the person she spoke about in such glowing terms only last year is guilty of orchestrating the sort of abuse that the Labour press release suggested he was orchestrating? It is just not true. 
Nothing in the email constituted that. And Joanne Lamont would serve her cause better if she said that the mistake and the misjudgment that Campbell committed has been accepted. He has apologised comprehensively. Surely that is the right way to deal with these matters, as opposed to suggesting he was guilty of things that palpably he was not guilty of. Joanne Lamont. <clears throat> I recognise Campbell Gunn's reputation as a fine journalist. One just wonders what has happened to him since he's come in to the employ of the First Minister. Because a personal attack on Claire Lally was that somehow the fact that she wanted to engage with politicians on the issue of how you care for children undermined her ability to describe herself as an ordinary mother. And that is the thing she has found more hurtful than everything else. But of course, from Claire Lally to J.K. Rowling, from Barack Obama to David Bowie, there is no target too ordinary or too powerful not to be attacked. Claire Lally is the kind of person we should encourage to take part in public life, not someone who should be abused, threatened and chased out of our national conversation. Claire Lally today is not just a carer's champion. She is a champion of everyone who believes in free speech. She's a champion for every woman in Scotland who has had the courage to lean in and offer a view despite the sexist abuse. She's a champion for everyone who believes a bullying government should be stood up to. Everyone who refuses to be shouted down by thugs with an iPad. Does the First Minister not realise that if he doesn't sack Campbell Gunn, we can only conclude that all the bullying that goes on, wherever it comes, is done by order by design, by him. First Minister. Uh, I hope that at some point Jan Lambert likes to reflect on, on these last remarks, uh, and if she has evidence for it, then to bring it forward. If not, then she should desist from making such remarks. Can I just remind Jan Lambert what the, the Code for Special Advisors says and why it says what it says? It was drawn up three days after the resignation of Damien McBride. It was drawn up because Damien McBride, the special adviser to Gordon Brown, was caught disseminating material uh, across the internet Order. and making up stories about the private life of opposition politicians. It was described by the Labour Party as conduct which was vile and evil. And uh, the code says that disseminating inappropriate material will be read to automatic dismissal. The email that Campbell Gunn sent to the Daily Telegraph in no way could be construed as being vile and evil. It was an email that pointed out Claire Lally had Labour Party, was in the Labour Party shadow cabinet and wrongly the daughter-in-law of former Labour Lord Provost of Glasgow, Pat Lally. Is anyone seriously saying that that email is equivalent to the activities of Damien McBride? That is nonsense to suggest so. Secondly, <laughs> to conflate what Campbell Gunn did and the mistake and misjudgment he made with abuse in the internet does not serve this argument at all. All of us, every single one of us, should condemn abuse yes. in the internet. Every single one of us should condemn that handful of mindless idiots who engage in such things in the early hours of the morning. But nothing in Campbell Gunn's email could be construed in terms of vitriolic, mindless abuse. It was a mistake and a misjudgment. But uh, Joanne Lamont does herself no credit and no service by trying to conflate the issues. Rather, we should, as a parliament and as a society, stand up against that handful of people yeah. who are attempting yeah. to pollute this independence debate. We have the most invigorating, enlivening debate, almost in political history, taking place in Scotland. And if all of us condemn such internet abuse and stand together, then we have a good chance of driving out of yeah. the debate. We shall not do that by attempting to suggest that Campbell Gunn is the equivalent of the activities of Damon McBride. Nobody believes that. Joanne Lamont shouldn't say it, and instead we should stand together and condemn true evil in society. Yeah. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. Uh, no Minister. plans, near future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding Officer, the Code of Conduct for Special Advisers 
is unequivocal. It's unequivocal both on what breaches the rules and what the sanction should be for that breach. It says the preparation or dissemination of inappropriate material or personal attacks has no part to play in the job of being a special adviser, as it has no part to play in the conduct of public life. Any special adviser ever found to be disseminating inappropriate material will automatically be dismissed by their appointing minister. In this case, the First Minister. The First Minister, who has stood here and repeatedly stated that the special adviser disseminated material that was both a mistake and a misjudgment. The Code here doesn't just prescribe what is right and wrong. It actually states what the sanction should be. The Code says when a special adviser breaks the rules in this way, he should be automatically dismissed. What part of that does the First Minister not understand? First Minister. Well, I, I've already said uh, Campbell's mistake was obvious. He, he wrongly suggested in an email that uh, Claire Lally was the daughter-in-law of former Labour Lord Provost Egg Pat Lally. The misjudgment was in believing, drawing attention to Claire's uh, Labour Party connections in an email uh, was somehow to Order. be construed as undermining her views and across uh, society. That was the mistake and the misjudgment. But to write to point to what leads to sacking under the Special Advisor's Code is disseminating inappropriate material. Can I remind Ruth Davidson what that was drawn up for? It was drawn up for Damien McBride's activities in engaging in the systematic and deliberate smearing of political opponents and their families in the most disgusting terms. His activities were described by Tessa Jill from his own party as malign, vile and evil. Now, no one who looks at Campbell Gunn's email no one who knows Campbell Gunn could possibly put it in the same category as Damon McBride. And therefore, this was not disseminating inappropriate material in terms of the Special Advisor's Code of uh, Conduct. What it was, a misjudgment and a mistake for which Campbell Gunn has comprehensively apologised. Ms David. Presiding officer, this is not the first time that questions like this have been raised in this chamber. In 1999, Donald Dewar dismissed a special adviser for giving misleading briefings to the media. Leading the prosecution was Alex Salmond. Yep. In the chamber, he challenged the then First Minister, <coughs> stating that the culture started at the top. I will quote his question directly. Mr Salmond asked the late Mr Dewar, will the First Minister accept that what is required is not just a change of personnel, but a change of political culture? Will he accept responsibility for allowing a culture to develop? We have an unacceptable culture of intimidation and delegitimisation that reaches all the way to the First Minister's office. Will he now answer his own question? First Minister. Well, I, I put the context. The email to the Daily Telegraph it's saying that drawing attention to Claire Lally's Labour Party connections was a misjudgment and a mistake that cannot be construed as a vile personal smear as the opposition have tried to do. It was a mistake and a misjudgment for which Campbell Gunn has apologised. Uh, can I point out, as last year, when Campbell was getting his long service award, yeah. Ruth Davidson said he was a scrupulously fair journalist who gives everyone, irrespective of a party, a fair crack of the whip. He's also one of the most interesting and engaging people at Holyrood. Is it really conceivable that someone whom, whom Ruth Davidson heaped such high praise last year has turned into the sort of uh, assumed dreadful person that Ruth Davidson now describes? If Campbell Gunn gave Ruth Davidson and every other politician in this chamber a fair crack of the whip, aren't we due to look at what was in the email and not conflate it with the vile abuse of behaviour either on the internet or indeed the activities of Damien McBride? Campbell Gunn made a mistake and a misjudgment for which he has comprehensively apologised. A lot of fair-minded people will see that is a reasonable thing to do when people make mistakes and misjudgments, and they won't try to conflate it with what we should all unite against, which is vile abuse in the internet, which can pollute our political debate. Why can't we just say that is not 
the prerogative of any one government or party or side of this argument. It is something that we should unite against as a parliament and as a society. Yeah. Supplementary, Christine Graham. Now, the First Minister will be aware that because of CO2 emissions in Newbars, Crescent, Gore Bridge and my constituency, 64 households will almost certainly have to be evacuated and their homes demolished, causing great distress. Can I ask the First Minister, while dealing with these issues is primarily for the Council, if his government will engage with the Council should it request support? First Minister. Yes, I will ask the, the Minister to seek a specific meeting with the Council to see if in governmental terms uh, there is something can be done to, to help. She quite rightly identifies this as primarily a council responsibility, but I'll ask Derek Mackay to seek a specific meeting with the member attending uh, to see if there's anything can be done in addition to help her constituents. Question three, Willa Denny. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues are of importance to the people of Scotland. Willa Denny. The First Minister just doesn't seem to get it. He was satisfied with an apology continues to defend the criticism of Claire Lally. And what is depressing is that no matter what his softer tone today, he's continuing to do so. When what he just said to Ruth Davidson, I have to say, just doesn't wash. The intention from the special adviser was not to help with the Lally family tree. The intention was a personal attack on Claire Lally, and that is a clear breach of the code. Why doesn't the First Minister understand that? First Minister. Well, you say that uh, I've defended. I've said it's a mistake and a misjudgment. I've said why it was a mistake and why it was a misjudgment. If it's said to be defending someone to point out the difference between what Campbell Gunn did and Damien McBride did and why it doesn't constitute the dissemination of inappropriate material as governed by the Code, then I think that's an entirely reasonable thing to do. Uh, most people will not regard drawing attention to somebody's Labour Party connections as anything other than a mistake and a misjudgment. It is certainly not vile personal abuse. One of, uh, one of Willie Rennie's coll colleagues, uh, Danny Alexander, on radio this morning, said that vile outpourings, uh, whether on the internet or from the First Minister's office, should be condemned. How on earth can that be construed as a vile outpouring? How on earth can it be equated with the abuse that takes place in the internet? And at some point, when mistakes are made, and Willie Rennie makes one or two of them herself, is not an apology the appropriate thing to go forward? I have made it clear what I expect from my special advisers. That is what I will do. But is not this apology a reasonable response to something which was not vile personal abuse, but was a mistake and a misjudgment? Well, Rennie. Claire Lally does not think it is reasonable. She did not think it was a reasonable apology. The First Minister has got to realise that to stand by Campbell Gunn is to defend this kind of behaviour. It is a matter of how we carry ourselves and how others see us. Claire Lally has got something to say about carers. She has got something to say about our country. But in Alex Salmond's Scotland, you have to be careful about what you say unless you work for him. Isn't it the case that Scotland is a little bit less of a free society today than it was last week? First Minister. Even in uh, Willie Rennie's terms, I think that's something of uh, a, a, an exaggeration. What I uh, object to in the way the opposition are dealing with is twofold. I don't think it's reasonable, given what all of us know about Campbell Gunn and his conduct over so many years, to suggest that Campbell Gunn has been in any way, shape or form orchestrating vile personal abuse, which understandably, whether it's in Claire Lally's case or any yeah. other case, upsets the person who's the recipient of it. To conflate what Campbell Gunn did with that vile personal abuse is unreasonable. What Campbell Gunn did was a mistake and a misjudgment for which he has apologised, which is the appropriate thing to do. Claire's contribution that I take enormously seriously, eh, along with other carers, has led to changes already in government policy. It has led to the consultation, which achieved a huge number of substantive contributions across yes. Scottish society. It has led to the proposals, which are going to be affected into legislation later this year. And amazingly enough, this is the first time 
at Prime Minister, at First Minister's questions, answering questions on this basis that I have had this put forward to me by any of the opposition leaders. Uh. So let's salute Claire Lally's contribution, whatever our politics, to bringing the contribution of carers yeah. to the note of Scottish society. Let's go forward with that legislation and make Scotland a better place for the carers of this country. Yeah. Question four, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish, Scottish Government's position is on the Ernst and Young uh, 2014 UK Attractiveness Survey. First Minister. Well, the Ernst and Young survey was one of uh, many uh, substantial and encouraging reports uh, which were released this week in terms of the Scottish economy. It shows that Scotland was once again the top performing area of the United Kingdom outside London for foreign direct investment in 2013, with the number of projects reaching a 16-year high. That is essentially, intensely encouraging news. It contrasts, of course, with the views of the Chancellor of the Exchequer some three years ago when he warned Scotland that the debate on the Constitution was going to put off foreign direct investment. Now we know that foreign direct investment is surging in Scotland. Now we know that this exceptional achievement has been achieved by Scottish Development International. Perhaps that's one of the scaremongering armoury of Better Together, which finally will be put to bed. Dennis Robertson. Um, I thank the First Minister for that response. Uh, and we, of course, we welcome the 16-year high. Does the First Minister agree with me that the continued dominance uh, from London perhaps, as was suggested in the Ernst & Young uh, statement, it risks overshadowing the rest of the UK and the only way forward for uh, an economic prosperous Scotland um, in the future, and to put Scotland first, is to vote yes. Third Minister. Well, it, it's, certainly, it's certainly true that the independent research from Ernst & Young shows that Scotland has a greater share of projects, uh, not just in terms of our average, not just second only to London across, uh, uh, across the UK, uh, but also in terms of key areas, uh, research and development, manufacturing, uh, a very substantial percentage of our inward investments last year were in these key areas, which helps to shape the Scottish economy uh, for the future. Uh, I really do think uh, the opposition party should bear this in mind. It is not that long ago since they were repeating the claims of the Chancellor of the Exchequer that in the, in, inward investment would be deterred, that investment in the Scottish economy would be deterred by the constitutional debate. Now we have these figures, not for one year, but over the last three years. Will they finally move away from scaremongering and embrace instead the success in the Scottish economy and salute the progress of Scottish Development International and our other agencies. Question five, Mark Griffin. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the survey published by Transform Scotland to mark the launch of its Fix It First campaign. First Minister. Well, the, the Government is committed to delivering a well-maintained transport network. The targeted programme of major road improvements is addressing Patrick McLaughlin's much quoted claim that there have been decades of underinvestment in our motorways and trunk roads. It is actually these decades of underinvestment we are now addressing, and in doing so with the M74, the M8, the M80, A96 Duelling, the Queensferry Crossing, the A9 Duelling, eh, we see substantial projects underway. We are the first government committed to linking all of our cities by motorway or dual carriageway, and he will have seen yesterday that the preferred bidder for the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route Balmeri to Tipperty NPD contract brings us another step closer to completing a project which will create an estimated 14,000 jobs and contribute over a period over £6 billion of added production to the economy of the north east of Scotland. I know that Mark is a, uh, an MSP from central Scotland. Uh, but I'm sure that just as he applauded the great projects in central Scotland, he will applaud the uh, western peripheral route starting in the route to Balmeri to Tipperty. Mark Griffith. Thank the First Minister for that answer. 84% of people want pothole fixed as a matter of urgency, and that was 79% in the north where those projects were going ahead. And that's no surprise since the report we had from the AA told us that 44% of people had their vehicles damaged in the past two years as a result of potholes. When will the Scottish Government step up and commit the resources to address the £2.25 billion worth 
of road maintenance backlog, which local government are struggling to cope with. First Minister. Well, I, 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 as, as Mark Griffin right, rightly knows, the, the maintenance uh, priorities are split between local government uh, and central government. Can I address the area under our direct control? In 2014-15, the budget for motorways and trunk roads is over £677 million. 30 per cent of that budget has been allocated for maintenance spending on the roads. That is £214 million, which is 28 per cent higher than the £166.4 million, which we inherited in 2007-2008. Now, I'm sure Mark Griffin will accept, as far as central government spending is concerned, that priority leading to a 28 per cent increase in maintenance spending on the trunk roads in the face of the extraordinary austerity programme from Labour and Tory central government is no mean achievement as far as central government is concerned, and therefore will accept that these figures demonstrate our priority, not just to building new roads through the great NPD programme, but for maintaining the existing trunk roads and bringing about some of the improvements which we both jointly want to see. Question six, Liz Smith. <coughs> uh, to ask the First Minister when the Scottish Government last met members of the Commonwealth Games Organising Committee and whether access to the special reserve was discussed. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government meets the Glasgow 2014 Organising Committee frequently to discuss a wide range of issues relevant to the delivery of a successful Games. In fact, I'm told here, and I find this difficult to believe, but Liz will correct me if uh, the information is wrong. Just yesterday, Liz Smith attended a meeting where the Director of Finance was present, but apparently she did not take advantage of the opportunity and asked no budget questions of the Director of Finance or indeed the Cabinet Secretary. Now, everything I know, I have to say, about uh, Elizabeth Smith would tell me uh, that, that Liz would have taken such an opportunity. So I'll give her full and fair opportunity to correct that information if it proves to be incorrect. But it does seem that both the Cabinet Secretary and the Director of Finance were available yesterday. And I'm sure if Liz didn't ask a question, there must be a very good reason for it. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, First Minister. I'd be delighted to take the opportunity with the First Minister now. A Scottish, exactly. government, a Scottish government official... Uh, stated that the Special Reserve Fund was only to be used in, what I quote, really unexpected left-field events. But in a parliamentary answer to my colleague John Lamont, Shona Robertson confirmed that the recent request to allocate 0.8 million from the Special Reserve Fund has been allocated for, and I quote, potential pressures that are associated with venue fit-out. Could the First Minister, as the person who sanctions the use of Special Reserve Funds, define the criteria by which meet the special circumstances test as defined by Audit Scotland and why, given that this is taxpayers' money, it was only through investigative journalism that the public was first alerted to these changes to the Commonwealth Games budgeting. First Minister. <coughs> right. Uh, I, I see it confirmed that Liz didn't ask the question yesterday, which I have to say shocks and surprised me, but I can confirm to her that the situation has not changed from when the Cabinet Secretary answered the identical question from one of her colleagues just last week, and that is that the Games continue to be delivered on time and on budget. Yeah. Can I point out to Liz Smith the total Games budget is £575.6 million, including the £90 million security budget and the two contingency budgets, the operational contingency and the special reserve. Now, I don't want to get into Donald Rumsfeld mode about predicting known unknowns and unknown knowns, but the special reserve is exactly there because it's recognised that there can be events in the proximity of the Games that require this budgeted for amount to be accessed. The protection for the public and for this Parliament is it has to be exercised by ministerial approval. But this is part of the Games budget which has been broadcast to this Parliament and elsewhere innumerable times. The Games budget is £575.6 million. Mm -hmm. The Games in Glasgow are being delivered on time and on budget. This is one of the few international events in history which can make that claim. Now, I think ourselves, our partners in Glasgow Council, the organising committee have done an amazing job to achieve what virtually no other Games or World events has achieved. And is it possible at some stage, perhaps in the enthusiasm when she attends the Games herself, that Liz Smith will give credit where credit is due to the organising committee? <laughs> That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.